What is it that makes us human? What differentiates us from the rest of the animals? Is it our erect posture and bipedal locomotion? Is it the size of our brain? Our capacity for abstract thought? All of that, no doubt, but also our ability to use tools and influence our environment. The history of humankind runs parallel to the discovery and manipulation of materials and their properties. From stone, bone, leather, to the development of pottery and metallurgy, using copper, tin, iron, as well as discovering and mastering the rest of the elements on the periodic table. From the understanding of electric and thermal conductivity to the mastering of optics, magnetism, and chemical reactions. From the discovery of superconductivity and superfluidity to the development of plastics, ferrofluids, complex ceramics, or graphene, and more recently, topological materials. We humans have been able to employ our intelligence and abilities to transform natural resources into tools, technology, knowledge, and well-being in general. Have you ever wondered what is behind all this? Let's take a cell phone, for instance. It has literally hundreds of examples of materials and devices that have been discovered, understood, and optimized, all thanks to condensed matter research. This is a transistor. The transistor is the reason why your cell phone, or any gadget that has a computer within it, fits inside of your pocket. Transistors are made of semiconductors, materials such as silicon or germanium that can be tuned to behave as a metal, conducting current, or an insulator, stopping it at will. This property allows the transistors to behave as switches, telling electric signals where to go, or amplifiers, transforming small signals into bigger ones. These two functions are the building blocks of computation. Thanks to its invention, Bardeen, Bertain, and Shockley won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1956. Transistors allowed the miniaturization of circuits and the production of computers as we know them today. Just to give a sense of scale, today there are more than 60 million transistors built every year per every single person on Earth. And yet, they can be as small as just a few atoms. In the screen of your cell phone, you find a liquid crystal display, the so-called LCD. Liquid crystals have properties between those of conventional liquids and those of solid crystals. They flow like a liquid, but their molecules keep their orientation. If we illuminate these molecules, depending on their orientation, they can block the light or let it pass through them. Because we can control their orientation using electric fields, liquid crystals are commonly used to form images and screens. They are used in many different things, in computer monitors, televisions, instrument panels, video players, watches, telephones, and more. Liquid crystals were discovered in the 19th century, but it was not until 1960 that the research made by Pierre-Jean Lejean turned them into the potential building blocks of displays and screens. His work earned him the Physics Nobel Prize in 1991. And the list of condensed matter materials and phenomena that make cell phones possible is a lot longer. High refraction lenses of the camera, magnetic devices in the microphone and the speaker, spin valves in the RAM memory. They are all the result of the last century of research in condensed matter. But what is condensed matter physics? Well, the American physicist and Nobel laureate P.W. Anderson helped popularize the name in an attempt to unify the study of matter in solid and liquid forms. These are the states where the interaction between atoms plays an important role. In these systems, something wonderful happens. Its physical properties cannot be predicted or described simply as the sum of the properties of its individual constituents. 
Instead, new and unexpected phenomena occur that can only be explained by the behavior of the collective as a whole. These are called emergent phenomena. Anderson explained these ideas in 1972 in his famous article, More is Different. Condensed matter physics has deeply changed the way we live, communicate with others, make businesses, or travel. It has driven advances in medicine, computing, and the efficient use of available energy sources. But this is just the beginning. Today, researchers work hard to find solutions to pressing problems and challenges to society. Have you ever wondered how your life would be like in another 100 years? Let's imagine together. Could we get rid of these huge high voltage lines that impact our landscape and use underground small size power cables instead? Today, around 20% of electrical energy is lost between power plants and households due to the resistance of the cables. This results in both an economical and environmental problem. Think of having zero resistance wires. We could build more effective motors, wind generators, or computers. But how can we create zero resistance materials? Well, as a matter of fact, they already exist. More than a century ago, Kamerling Ones discovered superconductivity. In a normal metal, electrons conduct electricity in the presence of an external electric field. It is inevitable that these electrons scatter from impurities and material defects, reducing their current carrying capabilities and consuming power. However, if we cool down to low enough temperatures, some metals undergo a phase transition and enter a completely new state of matter, known as the superconducting state. In a superconductor, the electrons interact differently and move in a synchronized way so that scattering from the ions and impurities cannot occur. As a result, superconductors lose their electrical resistance and can carry electricity without losses. But that is only part of the story. A side effect of this pairing is perfect magnetic shielding, levitation, and incredibly precise sensing of electromagnetic fields. Okay, so if they are so amazing, why don't we use superconductors in our daily lives? Well, in fact, superconductors are already widely used in science and technology. They are the reason why we can get medical images without damaging radiation using magnetic resonance imaging machines. They are also used in motors, compact generators, fault current limiters, transformers, or the world's fastest train, the maglev. However, we are far from exploiting the huge potential of these materials. Why is that so? Because the material needs to be cooled down to at least minus 200 degrees Celsius to become a superconductor. It is expensive to achieve and maintain this state. In the past few years, there's been a huge effort to increase the working temperature of superconductors by material discovery. The finding of the so-called high critical temperature superconductors has stirred the hopes of the condensed matter community. There is still a long way ahead to achieve the dream of an amazing new electrical world, but the general feeling is that we are close to the next quantum leap in superconductivity, with a significant improvement of their properties for applications. Can you imagine that we could design and develop materials that store more energy in less time? Or repel dirt from surfaces? Or are light? but unbreakable, impermeable to air and viruses, biocompatible, conducting and flexible, that produce lower emissions with greater computational power, or that allow diagnosis and treatment of diseases in a non-invasive way. All of these fantastic properties could be possible if we manipulate matter at the nanoscale with atomic precision. Richard Feynman already envisioned this realm of possibilities in his famous talk of 1959. There's plenty of room at the bottom. Today, this lecture is widely considered the birth of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is the manipulation of matter at a very, very small scale. And we are talking about molecules, even atoms. Nano stands for 10 to the minus 9th meters which is more or less the size of three gold atoms. The first visible effect of nanotechnology is miniaturization, as it happens with transistors. 
But nanotechnology is much more than making things smaller. When going to the nanoscale, new rules appear and the behavior of matter is now governed by quantum mechanics. We are progressing quickly in this field, and every day new applications resulting from research on nanotechnology are integrated into our lives. For instance, we are now studying how to functionalize drugs and how to deliver them to specific sites so that they can kill cancer cells while being harmless to healthy ones. There is a whole range of interesting objects in the nano world. Quantum dots, for instance. Very small structures where electrons experience quantum confinement and could be used in quantum information tasks or biomedical applications as drug carriers or imaging agents. There is also a chance that the TV set you will buy in a few years will have a quantum dot display. Quantum hall bars, two-dimensional semiconductors under strong magnetic fields that define the standard measure for various constants of nature. Carbon nanotubes, cylinders made of carbon that are amazingly stiff and can behave as metals or semiconductors depending on their structure. Nanoparticles of metals or semiconductors with unexpected optical properties such as controlled solar absorption or luminescence, sensor properties, and more. And very recently, graphene, a new material discovered by Andrei Geim and Konstantin Novoselov, for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2010. Graphene is a single layer of graphite, the common material used in pencils, for example. When graphite is exfoliated, single layers of carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb lattice emerge. In this lattice, electrons behave in yet another way that makes them different from normal metals or semiconductors. Graphene is a material of many attributes. It is the thinnest possible membrane, extremely stiff but bendable, impermeable, stable at room temperature, but chemically functionalizable, transparent, and one of the best conductors of electricity that exist. It has brought about a revolution within condensed matter physics and is considered to have so many applications that it is likely to impact many industries in the next few years. Not only is graphene a wonderful material, but its discovery and understanding has also led to the study of a whole range of other amazing two-dimensional crystals, such as molybdenum disulfide, hexagonal boron nitride, or black phosphorus. It is mind-blowing to think of all the advances these new materials will provide in our fundamental understanding of nature, as well as in useful applications for our society. We, humans, have come a long way. Perhaps you never realized that condensed matter physics was always around, helping us to answer questions and continue moving forward. But the road extends beyond the horizon, compelling us to travel on with an open mind and a hungry heart. It'll be a journey full of possibilities, full of opportunities and surprises. There will be stumbling blocks and unfathomable puzzles, but if history is anything to go by, we will overcome them all through the power of our curiosity and will. My room is Richard Feynman. He said that he was asked if one piece of knowledge was to be passed to the next generations and everything will be lost, everything we know will disappear, which, kind, which message will you pass to other generations? And he said that matter is made from atoms. You name a single um, technological development that we had in the 20th and 21st centuries and uh, I will tell you how condensed matter physics actually made it happen. There is, of course, some sort of misconception that, that fundamental physics is related to fundamental particles and that you somehow have to cut the material apart, go to the very bottom of it, to the very smallest of the small, and that then you've reached the fundamental level. And what we have learned in the last decades that this is absolutely the wrong way to think about this. And there is a famous quote by a colleague physicist of mine, Philip Anderson, who says, more is different. I think a good way to, to emphasize the importance of quantum matter physics is to come back to what one can call the three infinities. That is, we all know about infinitely big. This is the structure of the universe. We all know about infinitely small which is uh, elementary particles, but there is also the infinitely complex. But I think 
condensed matter physics is precisely a way to enter this third door, the infinitely complex. That is, we have systems made of atoms or molecules, so we know how these systems interact when there are only one or two of them. But as soon as we put a large number of them, then the system becomes complex and we have to invent new ways of thinking, new ideas to, to handle those systems, both theoretically and experimentally. Well, even people in industry, they search for rather, uh, for people who are creative. They mo value most the creativity, right? And I think that that's, that's, uh, you can be creative in many areas of science, but I think that in condensed matter physics, you have much more potential to develop your creativity. Okay. It is the branch in physics in which uh, we are exploding precisely this change of, uh, of concept, the, the, the concept that we could look both for applications and for fundamental laws, both with new experiments and with new theories. Uh, well, that makes it the, the most active part of physics nowadays. If you can control a material such that it has, you know, the perfect energy conversion from light to electricity, then you would solve the uh, the, the energy problem. Or uh, the battery, and that you can store energy without any loss, and you can collect energy from solar cells in Africa, bring it to you know where areas where there's not so much sun, you, know, you would solve your know, big problems. So in that sense, I think. Uh, uh, the grand challenges are directly connected to condensed metaphysics, absolutely, 100%. Science in particular has this usefulness argument and also do no harm argument. But often, and this is full of examples in physics and condensed matter, it is almost impossible at times to judge the usefulness of something and how useful it will be even in five years uh, at the time. So you have to fund research in all areas and hope that some small subset of them will turn out to be useful. Condensed matter, physics, chemistry, metallurgy, ultimately I think is going to be the salvation of humanity. Now it might sound grandiose or poetic, but at this point in time, the only way the species is going to exist for another 100 or 200 years is to solve pressing problems, whether they be energy, environmental, just in terms of uh, resources. Condensed matter physics is going to be how we discover and design the materials for us to survive.